All right. Thanks again, everybody, for joining. Today's wildlife for lunch is on Rio Grande Wild Turkey Management. Again, it's presented by Dr. James Cathy, the Associate Department Head and Program Leader, and also the Associate Professor and Wildlife Specialist at Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Today's webinar is made possible through funding by the San Antonio Livestock Show, or San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. So with that, Dr. Kathy, I'll pass the controls over to you, and it's all yours. Okay, fantastic. You know, uh, it's a it's a treat getting to build a program that's not feral hogs. It seems like feral hogs is dominating our park program for quite some time now. Uh, turkeys aren't uh, immune to feral hogs. I may uh, visit with you about that later on. But you know, Rio Grande Wild Turkey holds some of my most favorite memories of being in the field. Whether that's uh, a sunrise and seeing a flock of turkeys come off a roof, uh, to see the the sun on the feathers of those birds. The behavior that those birds exhibit as they're out there doing their thing from day to day is just tremendous. But I have to tell you that my most favorite memory is calling up a big Rio Grande wild turkey near San Angelo, Texas, as my son was sitting in my lap. And for him to take his first uh, spring gobbler was truly and, and truly amazing. So I've got a I've got a great affinity for wild turkeys and. We have uh, wonderful resources in our state. So let's visit a little bit more about these birds. What we're going to do today is uh, we'll do a bit of introduction, some biology, life history, and management of real grand wild turkeys as we head through the slides here today. So, you know, it's hard to believe that some of our wildlife resources that are so abundant today uh, were on the edge of uh, being extirpated in times past. Um, white tailed deer is one of those. We are bringing wild turkey and other wild turkey subspecies or among this group. In the late 1800s, they were hunted uh, through market hunters and, and other factors there, but the numbers were greatly reduced. In the 1920s, much of the population was extirpated over its original range. And I think I have a map coming up and we'll, we'll visit about that range here in just a second. Um, in Texas, it was believed that there were only about 100,000. Uh, real grandy wild turkeys left in the strongholds were in the Everett Plateau and in the South Texas Plains. And most birds from the Everett Plateau in particular has served as the nucleus for many people who endure turkey hunting today in other states, served as the nucleus for some trapping and transportation to develop populations in many other states. Here's that map. What I'd like to do is just visit with you a little bit about the different subspecies of wild turkeys. We have the eastern wild turkey. Um, all this area that you see my laser pointer, all this country in blue here, um, reaching from the eastern coast almost to the, to the Midwest. We've got the Midwest in here. And then we start picking up real grandy wild turkey shown in green here in Texas, Oklahoma, Western Kansas, and some in Old Mexico as well. We have the Miriam's wild turkey shown in red. I'm going to make my laser pointer show the difference here, so I'll just kind of move it around a little bit. But pockets of Marion's wild turkey stretching through uh, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Montana, and some of those western states. Here's the dual wild turkey range, and just touches us here in Arizona and New Mexico, with the bulk of their country being in old Mexico itself. Now, I forgot about the Florida wild turkey. I got to see this bird for the very first time about a year ago as I traveled through the central portion of Florida here. But uh, really enjoyed getting to see that bird. It's pretty neat. And looks a little different than some of our other birds. Now, another turkey that looks very different is the oscillated wild turkey here in the Yucatan Peninsula and into Old Mexico. And so if you get a chance to, I don't have that bird in this pre presentation, but if you get a chance to Google that up later on, a uh, very strange looking uh, turkey, uh, beautiful feathers on there, beautiful colorations on its head as well, but, uh, but uh, very different than the birds that we're used to. Now, you may have also seen that we have some hybrids out here. Look right here in Kansas between the eastern wild turkey subspecies and the real grains. And so some of those terms, those birds will hybridize. And sometimes I wonder about that here in Texas. Remember, those birds were once numerous across the plains. We met our birds there in eastern Texas. Think about the Trinity River as being about the western boundary of the eastern wild turkey. And then we start picking up our birds again on the other side of the river. 
I look at this blank space as you run from Oklahoma all the way to the North Coastal region. You have to imagine in the times past, that might have been an area that would be a birds with hybrid origin, much like what we have here in Kansas, a little bit in Oklahoma as well. So with uh, with like wild tail deer and with uh, with uh, wild turkey, there's some true conservation success goals. And we still have some stories that are uh, a population is being rebounded over time and for, for other species. And this is certainly the case with a real grainy wild turkey. And we're working our best on eastern wild turkey right now with our, our friends in Texas Parks and Wildlife in eastern half the state. But through harvest restrictions, uh, restoration efforts, uh, you bet it was by the, the calls and the stewardship of good landowners that real grainy wild turkeys rebounded across the Texas. And as I mentioned, our birds were used to repopulate some of those other states that you saw in the previous uh, map and slides of the different subspecies. Restoration primarily was a success from trapping and translocating birds to different areas. Uh, some, of you, some of you have probably read or you may remember that following World War II, there were many game farms that were developed. We tried to propagate wild turkey, uh, release those in the wild, tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of birds, not only turkey, but bot white and, and some other exotic birds were released out on the landscape, and they really just did not do very well. Now, part of my early history as a biologist was uh, I was a biologist for Texas Parks and Wildlife on Gus Inland Wildlife Management Area. And what a playground that is for both the, the hunter, the wildlife enthusiast, but particularly young biologists getting to play along the, the stream banks at Catfish Creek and get into the uplands of that coast of country. But if uh, if you traipse around the England area, you may find the remnants of old pens on the property where wild birds were, uh, actually birds were captured and placed in these things that were propagated by other means with uh, the hope to release those birds from the pen to establish populations of eastern wild turkey as well. So those structures still remain out there and like the other farm raised birds, they just do not do very well. But Bob White sometimes has said that the birds may be naive predators. Perhaps their flight muscles aren't very well developed. Maybe they don't even know their, their food sources. But there's a, a number of factors that come into play. And so those efforts just did not work very well. But with the release of wild birds and, and partnerships with other states as, as we relate to the eastern birds, um, we're doing our best in the east of the Rio Grande wild turkeys have done very well. Um, over time, their population seems to be on the decline. We've seen some populations kind of struggle since the 1970s. Uh, so if we look to Texas, what we have now are eastern birds in, um, in the color of purple here. You see in extreme eastern Texas. Um, some pockets scattered here and there. Some, some birds are doing better than others. One of my first jobs on the England area was to track eastern wild birds using radio telemetry. And, um, and the annual survival of those birds was pretty good. But our pulp production, the production of young, just really was not, was not adequate to sustain the population. It wasn't until the fifth year that I actually had eyeballs on pulps that we raised there on the England area. And uh, I understand that those birds are just kind of hanging on, not quite doing as well as we had hoped there in eastern Texas. So you see the range of the eastern subspecies here in purple. If we look to the Rio Grandes, they range from South Texas uh, all the way to the Red River. And then uh, pay particular notice on how some of these birds are associated with stream segments or, or canyons as they travel through some country. I want to come back to that stream idea later on. We do have a pocket of Marion swallow turkey, but another subspecies of bird in our state out in extreme western Texas. And there are some uh, hybrids between Rio Grande wild turkey and Marion here in western Texas as well. Now, the feathers on birds, they, uh, you know, I saw this right here. First time I saw the birds, these wild birds have five to six thousand feathers. And in my mind's eye, I can see Nova Silvi, Dr. Nova Silvi, mad at one of his graduate students in, in suggesting that, you know, the perfect project for you is to go count the number of feathers on wild turkeys. And I can see him, uh, 
you know, we've got to have a good sample size. And so there might have been multiple birds where that four graduates didn't have to go and count those feathers. But birds do have different types of feathers, and uh, they originate with that natal down that you've seen with other, perhaps poultry, other chickens, and the very fuzzy downy feathers. And then they go through four molt patterns to reach their adult plumage. There is a um, um, sexual dimorphism between the gobblers over here in the lower right and the hens in the upper left here. And, uh, you know, like many of the bird species, the males are quite showy. The iridescence, the copper, the greens, the yellows, the dark browns that this bird has is just astounding. Um, the colorations that even on its, on its head um, are pretty amazing to watch as they can transform those colors from time to time. And then the female here, you know, she's more drab in color, and um, that's probably due to the perfect coloration needing to stay silent and still whenever she's sitting in the nest. And so we see those colors uh, change between the males. Of course, this bird, this gobbler down on the lower right, he's in there strutting behavior, has his tail fan and this uh, beautiful arc here, and doing everything he can to attract the attention of the female. Males are larger than uh, than hens. Males can be around 17 to 21 pounds, uh, where females are smaller, 8 to 11 pounds or so. Now it's made get just a little bit bigger, but uh, but not so much more. A nice mature gobbler here with a big long beard that he has, doing everything he can to impress this female. And just look at her posture here. I don't think that she's impressed with all this good work that this gobbler is doing, but. Uh, Maybe maybe he'll do the right steps. Maybe he'll drag his wing tip just right. Maybe he'll boom just in the right way to gain the attention of that female. Some other differences that I want to point out here is um, um, some of you may have already been in the field with uh, archery season kicking off. And, boy, I love to watch where my feet go. Not only walk out for snakes, but it's a great way to find artifacts. It's a great way to see what's going on in the country with the tracks that are left behind in, uh, in the field there. So on gobblers, the toes, the middle toes could be four inches or longer, whereas it'll be shorter in the female, less than four inches in length or so. You can also take a look at differences in the feathers, whereas the palm on the breast feathers will have a black margin across the top, and the females will have this tannish, buffy coat, as we often hear it called, a light tan uh, marking its margin instead. Males have spurs on their on their legs, and those spurs are often used to in, in binding or protection protection. Whereas the hen, it may be just a small bump with all that all that they would have as far as fur is concerned. Um, it's also some differences between adult males and immature tom. The adult males, their feathers have all been replaced, and so you'll see this nice arcing a smooth line across the top of their tail fan, much like that palm that I showed you earlier, uh, whereas the feathers are being replaced with the immature palm, so they'll be coming along, and then you see that these are elongated here as the feathers are, are being replaced. Now, you don't even have to have the bird in hand to determine the sex of the animal that's out there. Take a look at these droppings that those birds leave behind. The hens, uh, you see some shape here that kind of pull up a little bit more. Whereas the gobbler may be elongated or it may be a day shoot tape or a hook um, showing a gobbler in this dropping. So as you're out there, let the landscape tell you what's going on. Um, I always think it's uh, important. I always try to, to read that. But, um, uh, I guess more, it helps me be more in tune with what's going on out there on the landscape. And, of course, we may see some other things and interact with the predators and predator tracks that may be following these turkeys around as well. So here's a, I was doing a program one time and I had someone remark, this is the ugliest slide I have ever seen. And, I, you know, I guess I can't argue with them a, a lot. The legs of turkeys aren't the most beautiful legs around. But uh, I do want to show you the difference between this, the spurs on this female right here. The spur is located right there. Let's see if I can draw a circle around it. Right here. Whereas, uh, and the juveniles that may be starting out smaller than even what we have right here. As the bird grows in age, you can see the spur beginning to elongate. And then uh, all those turkey hunters who may be on the line today, 
they're after this bird right here with uh, very long spurs, maybe an inch and a quarter or more, uh, began to really elongate and hook upward. Some of those folks may call this bird a, a limb finger. Uh, spurs would be long enough to, to hang that bird on the limb. So let's have a turkey quiz while we're here. Let's see what we've learned along the way. And uh, I need you to tell me which one of these birds is a female. Is it panel A or is it panel B? Okay, and I believe Clint has posted the question over there in the polling window to the lower right. So we'll give you a second to answer here. We'll see what, the, what we get among our crowd. Okay, there's uh, more than one clue in here for you. But only one of them will tell you the truth at the time. Okay. And he's tallying the results there. It's kind of like election night here. Okay. Clint, I'm going to leave it to you to post our answers when you get them, when you're, when you're ready to close the, the polling that we just signed. Hmm, okay. So I hope you're looking, and there we go. We'll see what the answers are. Um, those of you who picked panel A were correct. A is a female. And uh, B, let's see, good, good. So the majority of people uh, picked A, they were absolutely right. And so um, I wish I could ask the crowd here how you determine that. I hope that you remembered that it was the buffy coated breast feathers here, the tan kind of brownish feathers right at the margins, as opposed to the black margins on the breast feathers of goblin. Uh, you had another clue here, right? Because this, this is a beard. This is a modified feather that's often found in the male, but not always um, in the male. Sometimes the females will also have a beard. I think I have some photos coming up to show you the on how those might look. So good job on that. We'll have some more questions coming up, so uh, y'all be ready for that. Now here's that uh, photo. So in the males, typically the beard is, is much more robust. It's uh, much thicker, a lot more bristles to the beard. Than this female here. This is off of a bearded hen and uh, much smaller, not nearly as thick. Um, they do um, change in size as the animal grows. You know, a good beard would be anywhere in, in that range from 9 to 12 inches. I've even seen records of beards reading 16 inches in length, and that is just tremendous. I'd love to have that particular bird myself. Some of you may have shot a true trophy that had more than one beard. Uh, sometimes goblins will have more than one beard, and those are just kind of special birds that are out there. So I wonder about this bird. Um, Clint, I don't know if you have a question for this one, but is this a is this a female or a hen? Well, help me out with that if you can. Female or male? Okay, I'm going to look over here at the chat window. Let's see if I can see some of you responding in the chat window as well. Bear with me one second as That's I try okay. and post it. That's okay, Clint. I'll tell you what. We'll just kind of go ahead. I think you've got the others ready to go. I see some folks there in the chat window that are telling me that this is a female, and they're absolutely right because we've looked at the breast feathers here and we'll see that bucky coat along the margins of the breast feather. But this particular hen has that beard that I was telling you about. Typically, this occurs uh, low in percentage in a population, maybe two or three percent. I have seen records with some populations that have more bearded hens than others. In my running around the, uh, the western side of the state, I've only come across bearded hens on three occasions. Uh, but it's pretty neat whenever you see one of those animals. All right, here's another question for you. How about this tail fan here? Would this tail fan belong to an adult gobbler? or a juvenile goblin? And I think we've got a polling question for you on this one. Is it from a adult or not? You can click A for yes or B for no. Okay. 
we need some of that, uh, oh, what's the, what's the show with the countdown music? Alex Trevet. I don't know who I'm talking about. Right, so we'll give a chance for some folks to click their answer and plan any time you're ready to close that poll. That'd be just fine. All right, the answer for uh, those of you that got that, that was not an adult. Good, good. So um, we just about all got that right. Right, so the one in the lower right-hand corner is a gate. That's a juvenile. Can you see how the feathers kind of come around in the arc, and then all of a sudden these in the middle, they're being replaced, and so they're much taller than those on the outside edge. So that's a telltale sign that that's an, a, a juvenile bird, juvenile gobbler called a jay. Whereas in the adult, the margins of the felt band have that beautiful arc shape to it. None of those feathers uh, appear to be replaced. We don't see them sticking up right here in the middle. So good job on that. Let's see what else we have going on in this, this show. You know, the uh, pulps start line very small, only a few ounces in, in weight. This is that needle down that I was telling you about. But look right here. Look right by this fellow's thumb here. The primary feathers, the flight feathers, are already being replaced. And uh, these little guys need to be able to find just as quick as they can as predators are seeking them out. Okay, so they start with this nagel down. And you see the, the brown and kind of the tan coloration there. Uh, that's a great um, cryptic coloration. I was uh, on the England area one day. I had a good friend of mine, Todd Richards, who's a, a technician there. Todd had some chickens on his place. He had a bunch of little ones running around. And the red-tail hawk came by, and all the chicks just stopped what they were doing. They all hunted down. And with the few leaves that were around, they simply disappeared, even in Todd's backyard. And so it's amazing how this cryptic coloration and when animals get still, they can simply disappear in the background. So here's another bird, even at a very quick pace, right? So the, the nail down is replaced by about the 14th day. And so that is phenomenal growth, replacing these feathers. Look how elongated now the primary feathers are here, the secondary feathers here. Uh, the coverts are beginning to, to really develop. Uh, this bird is doing its best to grow its flight better so that it can quit staying on the ground and begin roosting in trees. And you might notice that this particular bird has a transmitter, a very small transmitter hidden behind the wings here. And this is the width antenna that's extending from the bird. So uh, Dr. Brett Collier and some of his uh, graduates and undergraduates have been tracking birds uh, for several years there in the Technic Field country. And this is one of the birds that they were uh, they were going and finding to see what they were doing. All right, here's another turkey quiz question for you. How many subspecies of turkeys are in Texas? Is it A, 6, B, 5, C, 4, or D, 3? As you're thinking about that, I'll point out a couple of things on this particular bird. Uh, you may notice that its feathers are kind of raised here on its back. And so whenever Dr. Collier and other researchers track these birds, they're fitted with a radio transmitter or a GPS transmitter. And it's uh, worn like a backpack with shock collar, shock uh, cords, rather. It'd be bad to have a shock collar on a bird. And the shock cord would be the, uh, the, uh, the string that was used to tie the, the backpack on. Now, there's something else special about this bird. Look right down here closely at its at its lower leg. You see that there's a metal band uh, on this bird, and that that shows that that's one of Dr. Collier's birds, the individual specific number to that animal. Okay. All right. So, how are we doing on the polling question? How many species were there in Texas? Was it six, five, four, or three? Okay. So, plan anytime you're ready to. Close that poll, that'd be just fine. This is what we want to see, by the way, folks. We want to see a lot of turkey hens out there. We want them to have many, many turkey eggs out there. So we'll get into some nesting material here in a little bit. Okay, some of you chose C, four subspecies of birds. Uh, but the correct answer, I believe, let's take a look is the three subspecies of birds in our state. 
Now we have the eastern wild turkey over here in purple. We have a real grandy wild turkey here. We have the third one, the Merriams here. And I might have tricked you a little bit with the real grandy and Merriam hybridization that's going on. Small pocket of that happening here in Western Texas. But there's only three subspecies of wild turkey here in Texas. Let's see what else we have. Okay, there's another question for you. And um, what about this bird? Is this a male? Yes or no? This is a, we have some more of this coming up here in a bit. In times past, researchers didn't have a whole lot of knowledge about what was happening out there at night. And just in the last 10 years or so, we have really been able to elucidate what's going on with animals out there overnight during the dark time hour. People's use of infrared equipment, or here the use of uh, game cameras to monitor birds. Okay, so I need you to help me out with this. And is this a male or, or not? Yeah, then has the question over there in the chat window, is this a male or is it not? But it's just a couple of characteristics there. I know it's not fair, but still, you've got to be able to figure out what's wrong. Right. Whenever you get ready to close that hole, it'd be, it'd be perfect. Okay. You know, Somebody in the chat window, tell me the, the program that I'm trying to think of. Uh, Alex Trebet is the host of and has a special countdown music in this question. Tell me how your mind works. All right, so let's see. We've got our answers post now over in the polling window at the lower right. And some of you said, is it a male? Um, six of you said, uh, yes, it's a male. Uh, the rest of you said, no, that it is not. Okay, so boy, I wish I could just clear with you to, to see how you made your answers, but boy, if you lift the turkey up, you get an easy answer. Look at this bird uh, sitting on a nest of eggs, and it's a bearded female. Okay, so she's a bearded female. And I wonder, do all turkeys sleep with their head stuck in their eggs, their head down? What's going on with this particular bird? Well, if you've ever had an incubator, if you've ever raised uh, poultry yourself, you'll know that she's turning the eggs. She's keeping them viable by moving them over and over again. All right, good. So that's a female, a bearded female on, a, on some eggs. All right, here's a, another one for you. How about this quiz? Is this dropping, is this dropping from a turkey hen or not? A hen or gobbler? Okay. All right, good. I see some folks in the chat room that are answering. And Clint, I think we'll just uh, we'll just roll on with this one. Um, it is a gobbler. It's not from a hen. It is from a gobbler. And it's uh, the elongated shape that we saw early on in the presentation with the elongated shape. Remember, sometimes the gobblers may have a hook uh, shape to it as well, whereas the females, it may just be a little puddle there. Uh, so differences, you don't even have to have a bird in hand to determine the differences between the sexes. Okay, good. That's a gobbler. All right. Researchers have been studying wild turkey force for many decades, and one of the ways that they put their hands on turkeys is with the use of drop nets. And so if you get a chance to go to our Wildlife and Fisheries Extension YouTube channel, you'll find a uh, video that Dr. Sean Locke created uh, with some of Brett Collier's folks that shows the use of drop nets and capturing wild turkey like we have here. What would happen is that the, at the center pole, the center pole, bait would be placed, typically corn, would be our bait here. And as the birds would come over, you got a biologist or a graduate student, someone hiding in a blind over here, they're monitoring that uh, visually. And whenever all the birds get to the center, the net is rocked. And of course, everybody runs out there and grabs the turkey and starts to process that bird, um, whether that's trapping and placing in a box to share with other states. Uh, whether it's taking uh, morphological measurements on that bird or whatever it is, that's that's um, you need a team of people to drop on that in bird that saw on the previous slide. Another trap that people use is the Davis walk-in trap. This is just a, a a box that's constructed out of four by four inch mesh panel, welded wire panel. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's our own Texas Park Wildlife Biologist Kyle Melton 
right there in the middle of the turkey flock. The idea is to bait the trap with corn. The birds walk in, as you see this bird right here. And then what happens once they get in there is they typically just follow along the margins of the trap. They go round and round following the margins, and they don't find their way back out to where they once came in. Okay, so uh, biologists and, and Dr. Carter's team would go in there and begin to work those turkeys. Now, we've also advanced in our, our equipment that we've used over time. Back when I was tracking the Eastern Wild Turkey, we had these transmitters in the upper left-hand corner of each line. And you see the whip antenna that would come out uh, out of the transmitter itself. Um, the birds were fitted using that shock cord and uh, wearing that transmitter as a backpack. And then more recently, Dr. Parger has some really cool movement data on real Grandy Wild Turkey. And you see the guys, uh, the transmitters look similar to the, to the old style. Uh, now they can download data and see the uh, movement patterns with much more detail than, than using a compass and a map to triangulate on the position of a bird. Uh, this also takes, uh, you know, you need a biologist to do it all the way to go out there and try to triangulate on multiple birds and go back and map those things, whereas the data is stored here or, or sometimes the data can be sent directly through one's computer for assessment as well. So uh, with some of the older equipment, even the newer ones still have a radio beacon. And uh, here's Tom Melton, uh, who's had a yogi antenna. So what he's doing is he's dialing in the frequency of his, uh, his of a particular bird and of his receiver. And then this yogi antenna, he can use it directly. He can sweep it back and forth to listen for the strongest signal where that bird is located. And if he needed to, say he was working on this, he could, he could home in on the signal, wherever the signal was strongest. He could find the actual nest or where that bird would be located be sitting in there. And so some of these data are used in movement, nesting, survival, and production uh, on real green wild turkey in the boats. Once they have those birds in hand, they would fit those with that, that uh, leg band that I was telling you about earlier. Uh, here the guys are, are doing that. You see the leg band with an individual uh, ID for that bird. They may even take a blood sample for a genetic assessment. You see them doing that here with this syringe. Uh, it might be that uh, that's used and, and collaborated with other researchers. Uh, if you've seen these trucks riding around your, your county roads and have this antenna on top of it, they are not tracking UFO. Those are, those are good biologists doing what, what we do, uh, trying to figure out how birds move, how they interact, what our production is on in this. So once all those things were done, the birds were released. And uh, you see as one's being released here, uh, the guys in the background are working up the second bird, so they try to be efficient with their time as to not cause too much stress on the bird and get them back off the Here's some data that Dr. Carter shared with me here recently. This is using GPS information on a number of birds that were tracked over time. And one of the things that I'm always curious about is the birds that I see in one location, uh, say I'm on a fifth ranch, oh, is that the same plot or the different plot? How do these animals move? And so it's kind of interesting with some of the data that they've derived that on average, the overall distance within a day is about 4.1 kilometers. Uh, you see a couple different movements in the morning, uh, about almost three kilometers here. In the afternoon, um, past are sticking closer to the roof site, and um, the movement is about 1.2 kilometers in uh, this particular study. They move about in search for food and move at four meters per minute, meandered around to find uh, whatever they may be eating, or whether the turkeys are generous. I think I have some food data information coming up for you as well. Um, you might also see that this is an aerial photograph of a ranch in South Texas. There's a, uh, a primary roost site shown by this star in the middle of the screen here. So if I can draw a circle around it. And then there's secondary roost sites as well, demarcated by the, the yellow dots that are out there as well. And so turkeys may have some location that they want to go back to. It's their, you know, it's where they they make a living. It's their primary spot. Uh, but it may be that perhaps they're out there foraging and it's not you can't make it back to the the rich tree at the time that you have remained. So they may have some other sites that they overnight in as well. Okay. So you can see that in their studies they had the primary uh, 60 knots were used by the primary roof site. Uh, there were nine secondary roost locations on this particular ranch, and they did those for 15 months. Uh, here's some other interesting information that, that 
that was provided to us. Um, I also want to know, whenever I'm sitting out there, how many neighbors do I share these birds with? How many of us are taking care of these wild turkeys in the flocks? And so what we have is one particular bird. This is 3057. And you see that there's multiple locations where this bird was tracked. And we have the feral range estimates where they spent the bulk of their time. So here's 3057 at the bottom of the screen here. And for uh, most of the time, those polygons, we see that they ranged over 404 hectares, which is about 1,000 acres, to give you an idea of the size of uh, the range that we're working with down in that area. Um, on the other end, what's the most important area? What's the core area that they're dissipating in? What are they doing? And here we have them in using 35 hectares or 86 acres. And one of the things that, that Brett and others have pointed out is that uh, it's important to target your management for wild turkeys. What's, what's going on with this piece of property over here that this bird did not utilize? Is there something that can be done management to make it more attractive? Or conversely, if this is not good for the habitat for whatever reason, save your dollar and place um, financial practices somewhere that's more conducive than would benefit the birds. Movement of birds we have in the spring, the bred hens move independently from the other hens that are not bred. During the summertime, our gobblers move uh, separate from juvenile males and non-bred females. In late summer, remember those hens are on this during the summertime, and uh, during the late summer, they're beginning to form back up in the brood flocks, and then the males join again in the wintertime, and uh, it's my hope they're not too long from now. I'll be in the pasture, listen to those birds coming off the roof, and has both the uh, males and females associated with them. The behaviors that turkeys do just simply astound me, the vocalizations that they do, the strutting that's going on out there is just incredible. The gobbles that they do, if I could do a gobble for you, I would. Uh, uh, maybe they only do that for a select few of you out there on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, but they do everything they can. The males do everything they can to attract the attention of the female. There's a set series of behaviors that they go through. Hopefully, uh, in the end, there's uh, some breeding that goes on, and that means they will brown in the near future. Some of this, uh, in times past, we've used uh, fake nests or dummy nests to monitor the production of birds over time. More recently, researchers have been using game cameras to monitor real nests for live birds. And that's true not only for turkeys, but uh, Dr. Morrison here at the Texas a &M has uh, done that with, with uh, black cat vireo uh, as well to monitor those, those special birds. So here it is. You know, you have your camera set up over a turkey nest. You can kind of see the behavior that the bird does, and then turning the eggs that we saw in the previous screen. The eggs are, are kind of creamish in color, a few speckled brown specks there that have some coloration that may, may lend themselves to blending in. Uh, typically, the nest sites are, are grass clumps or brush piles. Um, what I saw with the eastern birds, they often wanted something at their back, some type of brush. Maybe it was a small tree. It also provided some protection overhead to give them uh, maybe just that advantage over some of the avian predators that may be looking for. Typically, a hen lays somewhere between eight and 16 eggs. Uh, on average, you know, you can imagine that being about 12 eggs or so. As you see in the photo here, there's not much preparation that goes on in the development of the nest. It's not like they weave branches together or go gather grass, as we see with some of the songbirds. Typically, it's just a scratched out shallow area. You may think of the size as being that of a, a large dinner plate. Um, you can almost put the, a plate over the top of that nest and, and uh, gives you the bounds of the nest itself. Um, there's been research into the nesting intervals. Uh, this is this is Bob Cook up here in 1972. It was uh, tracking birds and, and learning about three or grand ball turkey. And so uh, nesting in that, that particular time began in February. Uh, Kyle Melton, uh, during his graduate work in every plateau as well, you see that nesting began in April. If we go to the Rolling Plains, we have uh, a couple of other researchers for that one study showed that began in March, another showed it in April. Uh, down in South Texas, um, Sam Beesom and others have done research down in that part of the world. You see that the nesting begins there in April. And so that plays into our management strategy as well. There may be some times where uh, we want to have our prescribed burning done. 
Uh, we may want to move cattle out of a particular pasture that we know that their birds like the nest in. So just kind of keep these dates in mind. So uh, February and April for the Everest Plateau uh, begins about March in the early plains, begins in about April there in the South Texas plains. As I mentioned, the eggs are, are kind of a cream colored with tan speckles. Incubation begins when the last egg is laid. Uh, so that hen is laying an egg per day. And then once all the eggs are laid, she sits that nest for 28 days. And that is a long time to be uh, sitting on the ground and avoiding all the predators, but also my turkeys. Those hens may be looking for grasses, as you see down here, some of the box grasses with loose stems to provide good nesting habitat. Um, what I saw with the eastern birds on the England area and it's been documented elsewhere is that there's often a often nests are laid in proximity to roadways, think of ranch roads, those types of things. Uh, and then low brush is going to be important. Think about that pole who's trying to develop a slight but it's just as quick as it can. Maybe it can piggyback here on some brush and get up into some low limbs as it begins to roost overnight off of the ground. So here's a here's a turkey nest. Uh, let's see if we can draw a circle around it. So let's try that again. Right here at the, the base of this tree, um, you might note that this hen would have the something to her back that has the overhead protection as well as this lava oak tree. And so that's uh, something that I've seen uh, a couple two three times on birds. Now, as I mentioned, that's a long time to stay on the ground. And nest success is typically not that great. So here's the percent of successful nests in the Edwards Plateau and Cook study, about 39%. That's actually pretty dang good. I would hope for that and more. Uh, you can imagine that down here, the split the South Texas Plains and studied by Dean Ransom, only 12% of the nests were successful. And you can imagine that that has a, an impact on the number of birds that were recruited into the adult population. So uh, we want to do all we could to, to help those birds be successful in nesting. And typically that comes from good land school to make sure the habitat's in perfect condition for those birds to hide in and raise their poles and uh, get them to find condition. So rainfall is hugely important to nesting success, not only to our bob white that we might chase around as well, but to Rio Grande Ball Turkey. Um, the yearly total is more predictive of, of good production years as opposed to actually the winter rainfall is a better predictor uh, over spring rainfalls, but man, we're gonna have good spread out rain over over the year itself. Um, and of course, we've had some difficult times here. The drought of 2011, production for birds wasn't that great. But uh, I'm hoping that we have a good hatch this, this year and we seem to be setting up for a good hatch going into the next year as we can. Range condition, range condition, range condition. Please do everything you can to make sure that your property is in wonderful shape, as you see down here in the corner left hand corner uh, for those birds whenever they do go on board. That equates to the food resources that that bird has. You have to be in great body condition in order to have uh, to produce those eggs. That comes at a huge biological cost to the female. All right, so let's let's do another turkey quiz here. Um, true or false? Turkey hens only build their nests in the largest trees available because these have the largest limbs to support weight and weight. I know some of these are hard. Some of these are hard. So pick A for true or B for false. You can hear in a little bit. We'll, we'll close the polling window. All right, but they, they put their nests in trees, particularly those big horizontal branching trees. All right, I'm looking in the chat window as y'all are answering the question. I think it's going to close whenever he gets ready to. I still have this middle block going on about how to prevail. All right, good. There's our answers. Um, um, so of course, uh, of course, turkeys don't have their their nest in trees. They nest on the ground. So good. Everybody got that right. I have to give y'all some harder questions next time we do a webinar. Okay, let's see. How about this? I got a harder question for you. How many eggs does a turkey hen lay? Is it about 20? A, is it about 12? Is it about three? 
And isn't this a good looking person to me? Now, all right, there's your question over in the polling window. It's about 20, 12 or so. Where's the three as you lay? Okay, we try to figure that out. Brilliant, whenever you're ready. All right, good. Most of us got that right. It's going to be B, about 12 eggs or so. Now, remember that range was from about 8 to 16, so they could have more than 12. But on average, she's going to have about 12 eggs in her nest, okay? About 12. All right, let's see what else we have. Okay, there you go. There's your answer. About B, 8 to 16. Okay, now, you better get your calculators out for this one. Given an 8 eggs laid. About how many days does it take for a clutch to hatch? Given eight eggs laid, about how many days does it take for a clutch to hatch? Is it A, 36, B, 26, C, 16, or D, 10? This guy looks like me in every math class I had at Texas a &E. I was always wondering about those numbers. All right, given eight eggs laid, hmm, about how many days does it take for the putts to hatch? A 36, B 26, C 16, B 10. Sounds like I'm trying to send somebody to battle for All right, there's our answer. All right, so let's find out. Go here. All right, those of you who chose 36 got it right. Ah, I got you on this one, folks. About half of you chose 25. All right, so remember that she's laying an egg each day, laying one egg per day. You did that eight times, plus the incubation period, about 28 days, and that's 36 days on the ground before they hatch. Okay, now, uh, Remember that it's also about 10 days for that turkey bolt to grow its flight feathers sufficient enough to get into the brambles, get into the brush, and you know, fly up to a uh, branch to roost over the So think about that. About 46 days of being on the ground with every skunk, raccoon, gray fox, coyote, snakes, everybody is after you if you're a turkey, particularly if you're a little turkey bolt. Okay. So 36 days on that um, that question. Okay, good job. Uh, now remember Kyle Melton when he had his receiver and not the antenna. Um, this radio transmitter right here in the middle of all this. Uh, this radio transmitter, once it lays still for about an eight-hour period, um, if it were active, it would sound like beep beep beep. Oh, no, no, it would sound. Well, I can't remember. It'd be slower, faster. Uh, whenever it's uh, whenever it's Set for eight hours, it'll be a uh, mortality signal, and then Kyle can home in on the signal. All right, so also look up here. We know this is uh, our bird because we got a transmitter on it, but we can figure out which bird it was by adding that red band. Of course, it's out in the frequency for this radio transmitter. Kyle knew all along. All right, so sometimes other things get our birds, like some of those predators that I mentioned. And so let's take a look at that. Um, from my experience on the England area, whenever I saw a bird like this, and typically the highest mortality for him is during the nesting period. Um, you can imagine she's she's on the ground and she's been there, thinks she can't set that nest. Sometimes she falls victim to a predator. But whenever there was messy, whenever there were feathers strewn about everywhere and the bones were really crunched up, and it seemed like they always crushed on my transmitter just to make sure I had spent money to buy another one. Uh, this was more indicative of a kingdom, it's more indicative of a, a fox or a coyote that would cause that kind of damage on a bird. As I remember, this particular bird was killed by an owl, and a uh, portion of the, the head was consumed by the owl. And if I remember right, when they remo removed this carcass, there's a, a clutch of eggs that she was incubating at the time. So as I mentioned, 
uh, everybody's after you if you're a pole. And so these are documented occurrences uh, that show that poach webs, such as rat snakes, coyotes, bobcat, raccoons, all of those prey on poles, all of those prey on the nest. You may see that there's a number of those animals that prey on the adult birds as well. Um, we have coyotes, bobcats, raccoons, they, they need to get them every the chance they get, and all of those growth stages and in times of age. Um, so even, even a non-banded armadillo is then documented and still predating a nest every time. And, but often whenever I'm running around the state, I have people tell me that one of those armadillos are just the, they're just taking out nests left and right. I wonder about that. I don't think that they have as big effect as some of the others. In fact, uh, what, uh, Dr. Carter and his crew found is that in this study, raccoons are very popular for the most common nest predators ever out there. And one thing that was kind of neat, they had a couple of occurrences where um, if a predator depredated the nest, the hen may, she may fight, she may try to, to do all she can to deter that depredation event, uh, but she may even come back in there and set the nest and, and maybe raise a, a fault or two. And in one case, they had more than one predator that came in on the nest. Um, if you look very carefully down here in the lower left-hand uh, window, this little yellow thing is a holt, a fuzzy, nailed down holt. And this serpentine shape going back here into the brush and well covered, the camouflage itself is a coach up snake that caught that particular bird. Okay, the guys had the radio transmitter on these birds and happened to get that shot. Um, as, this, as I heard them say, they found a couple of their transmitters up in the top of this uh, juvenile red tail hawk's nest. There's the Adult birds caught a couple of bolts and fed them through their own young, so that energy is being transferred into other life forms out there as well. And that's just to be expected. I want to show you a couple of the cameras that were captured, uh, a couple of pictures that were captured by the game cameras that, that Paul you and others were using. Here we have Rocky Raccoon. He's eyeballing that curtain hand. She's doing everything she can to make herself look much bigger than what she is. She boom, she pulls up her tail fan to try to stir it. And uh, in this particular case, she was not successful. She had to go or she might uh, be killed herself. Dr. Raccoon came in there and today did this. But I did want you to see that behavior that the birds do. They do their best to um, put all that reproductive effort to recruit other animals into their population. Uh, other nest predators include bobcats were documented, uh, feral hogs, of course, an exotic invasive species, not supposed to be there at all taking our wild resources. Uh, spotted skunks, this is kind of neat. Uh, the sea of spotted skunk captured on camera today in the nest. So the animals are kind of rare in and of themselves. Ravens also took some eggs from time to time. And uh, what we would hope to see uh, going in are a beautiful nest like this. As biologists, if we honed in on the nest to see if we were successful or not, this is what we'd want to see, two pieces of eggs intact. All the contents are located right here in the nesting area, uh, but more times than not, we see that the nest is scattered about, eggshells may be crushed, uh, eggshells may be broken, sometimes the eggs are carried away all together. Uh, snakes do eat eggs, oftentimes if eggs were missing, uh, they would be, snakes would be accused of doing that, but many of the other animals also carry those eggs as well. So I want to turn to the quiz here. How is uh, mortality higher in adults over poults? More mortality in adults or in folks. Uh, for the second time, I think I'm going to move on. Uh, the answer is uh, the higher mortality is uh, with folks, with the young. The nest production, as you saw in some of the other slides, very hard to get those young birds on the ground. But I will tell you that come November, I will be looking for that very special turkey, that adult bird, that will wind up on my uh, Thanksgiving table. I want to visit with you about some management considerations as well. If I don't have things on my calendar, it was just a good intention. And so I would really hope that you would work with some wildlife biologists to develop a well-written wildlife management plan to put your activities on the calendar to make those things a reality. And when I'm thinking about Rio Grande wild turkey or any other animal, what I want is usable space. I want diversity in my property. Not only the plants that are there, but the structure as well. Uh, the patchwork that you see across the screen, 
through the field, the ag field that can be used as an area for display or for food. I have this live creek system that we're all in through here. Uh, this is a great place to find roosting trees like ponds and hackberry uh, and other sycamores that we serve as good roosting sites. I'm going to do everything I can with a good land steward to build that special habitat that provides for food, water, shelter, and space. Now, one of the things that I'd really like for you to do is to seek out your wildlife management associations in your area. Um, the best nickel that you can stand is on someone else's mistake. And um, uh, to learn what did not work is where I'm going with that. And so often our wildlife management associations, the group of neighbors who may be working with biologists, managing their property in a like-minded fashion. Uh, we're pretty independent Texans. Uh, I think we had a phone question that would be 100%. So not everyone is doing the exact same thing, but they're doing things that are similar, that have similar goals and strategies. And that just increases your usable space. So your property is uh, 150 acres in size. Well, that's a little bit small for Rio Grande wild turkey. But if I couple that with my neighbors, then my land mass just increases. So um, definitely take a look at that. Texas Organization of Wildlife Management Associations. There's also some mapping things out there like the Trinity River Management Information System that has wildlife management areas as one of the layers that you see in maps. Remember early on, I wanted to uh, show you these creek systems. Uh, we, here we see these birds that are moving up creeks in Oklahoma and in western Kansas, even into Colorado here. Sometimes I think that our wildlife management associations need to be associated with uh, water systems. This is where Collier has this idea with me uh, many years ago. But wouldn't it be neat if we knew all of our neighbors here in the Chambers Creek or Richland Water Creek water pit? This is an area in Navarro County. Uh, in Ellis County, where uh, a recent release of Rio Grande Wild Turkeys took place. Wouldn't it be great if we had all of those neighbors thinking about the same type of activity on their property, the same goals in mind? And our own Jay Whiteside, technical guidance scholarist over there, has folks in, in, with that mindset working on Bob Bike Quail that's, of course, uh, benefited on Rio Grande Wild Turkeys as well. If I'm thinking livestock, and Clayton, I see we're bumping the, the one o'clock time frame. So y'all will have to tell me uh, when you're ready to haul a cap rope. Uh, so Clint, I'm counting on you to call this thing to a close when you're ready. Um, if I'm thinking about uh, livestock compatibility, the very first first thing I want to know is how much forage do I have in the pasture. That dictates my stocking density. But if wildlife are large on my scale, then probably where I'm at with livestock is I'm stocking at a low <clears throat> to moderate density of livestock. And then, of course, I'm going to have great cross fencing with my piece of property, good water distribution so that I can move that livestock around um, so as not to compromise it in any one spot. If I'm doing all the things right as a livestock manager, then I get pretty family photos like this. Uh, big old herper bull uh, throwing a nice cap there. But uh, if I'm not doing things right, then I may be like this, this uh, picture up in the upper left hand corner, which one of these will provide more pounds of forage, well, it's definitely going to be A. If I have that much bare ground there as opposed to the, what we see in the lower area here, then as a livestock manager, I've missed the mark. My country looks like that. I should have gotten rid of cattle, uh, should, should have deferred for some length of time before I came back with my livestock. Same way here. I just want you to, to see this. If you drive the roads of Texas, uh, you, it's easy to note that there are some folks that need to do some better stewardship out there. They're doing long-term ecological damage to the property, but their immediate economic return is a certain compromise if we push the country too far. And Mother Nature throws us a curveball like the drought of 2011. And I sure hope we're uh, working our way out of that now. But if I have my property looking like this in the lower left-hand corner, then I've got a rangeland that's prepared to capture rainfall, prepared to hold that water, to allow it to infiltrate to our groundwater systems to begin feeding streams in other areas. And guess what, folks? This is great for my livestock, and this is great for my wildlife. And so uh, for Ojim Kathy, that's where I would be headed with my management style. Uh, you've probably heard the, the phrase, take half, leave half. Well, what that really means is that I can only take 25%. If I take more than 50%, then I'm compromising my root system. As you see in the example here, I eat the above ground biomass down. And I'm really compromising this, and I'll wind up with all that bare ground that we saw on the previous screen. 
but not all that grass gets to go into my livestock, right? Because we have animals like this army worm here, or we have those grasshoppers, and I've seen a lot of grasshoppers here lately. And uh, if I had my way, I would be receiving nuisance phone calls about rear granny wild turkeys and bob lice, and it would be helpful to us as those are important protein sources and water can food for a number of birds as well. So remember, just take 25% of what's out there. And there's some good publications that we have on rain plant monitoring. We have some wonderful videos for you on that as well to show you how to do that. A simple way to monitor rain plant conditions is the construction of these forage cages. Uh, so the forage cage, this vegetation inside will be protected, protected from herbivory. Uh, so all the livestock will be able to use this on the outside. So if this is getting short, you know, whereas this is tall, then I need to be adjusting that livestock uh, stocking rate. Um, now here's a, a gentleman, some of you may recognize this fellow. This is Mike McMurray. And uh, Mike and I were over in Lee County and found this um, this blue stem grass. And, and uh, uh, Mike's, you know, Mike's about as tall as I am out there, but this blue stem was uh, up to his shoulders, as you can see. And as far as uh, livestock is concerned, um, maybe we need some more livestock in here to help open this country up. Perhaps we need to use some prescribed burning to open this country back up. Because if you were a turkey fault trying to move to that jungle, you wouldn't make it very far before all your community was extended. So there are some things, there's definitely uh, cattle and livestock of the prices, or definitely a wildlife management tool can be for a better use for this particular pasture. Uh, I mentioned prescribed burning. Again, one of those tools that you can learn from your neighbors, and so I want you to be aware that prescribed burn lines are vectors. Um, there's other organizations out there where there's there's equipment that's used in concert with one another. But wouldn't the understanding of trial fire be easier to grasp when you're you're working with your neighbor and you use that common equipment and you gain from the experiences and the conversations that ensue after prescribed burn. Um, prescribed burning is one of the cheapest, most effective ways to manage Texas land when it's in, in as I mentioned, there's boundaries, prescribed fire, there's boundaries in certain conditions in which you would do this. Very different from a wildfire. And if we're doing this right, not only are we benefiting wildlife and livestock, but we can have some fuel mitigation as well. So I would definitely ask you to take a look at the prescribed burn alliance in Texas and uh, begin to see who's in your area. Glenn, I'm going to ask you now how we're doing on time. We're uh, we're probably still good for right now. We'll go okay. for another five or so, ten minutes, if you can okay. wrap it up by then. Sounds good. You haul a cap rope. Sure. Okay, so prescribe burning, we've got to be smart when we do that. Um, it may be that that if there's uh, it definitely it definitely stimulates orb growth or, or weeds or orb coated seeds. Uh, that means that there's homes for snails and bugs and other things that are important as our birds uh, began to gather resources for um, putting pulps on the ground. Now, as I mentioned, we've got to be smart about this, and so we probably need to watch out during the early spring and early summer when uh, nests may be out there on the ground or turkey pulps may be on the ground. For instance, you may see this turkey pulp right here in the middle of the circle, but how many of you saw this little guy? right here. You see his beak, uh, shape of his head here. Um, I asked the audience one time how many turkey poles they saw, and that gentleman that answered that he saw five turkey poles out there. So he's got a better eye than I do at long time too in the spring. Um, I think what we might do is end with this slide um, and then see if there's any questions for those of you who were able to hang on. Uh, turkeys are generalists in the diets. They eat from the green foliage and the seeds from the forbs that I mentioned earlier. The mast from dewberries in the upper left hand or agarita in western Texas. The berries are seasonally important. Acorns, of course, I see a lot of acorns that are falling right now. All these things are great when they occur, um, but, you know, they're seasonal and those resources are being used up. And so they rely on other things like, you know, imperial, maybe those beetles and caterpillars and grasshoppers and, and anything else they can get a hold of. But other things are the, the seed from um, uh, Tapsahio, there's wild onion, rescue grass, even the berries from uh, low bush or pecan. All those items are very important in the turkey's diet. So if we're doing the great things that we need to 
as a land steward using the tools of a lot of local active cow pile, fire, and gun. And we really put those things on the calendar and we can um, bolster our turkey populations and enjoy them throughout the year. All right, Ken, I, uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the Texas Wildlife Association putting on this. I do want to go to one more slide here at the very end. Special thanks uh, to Dr. Carter for sharing his, uh, his photos and his counsel and his graduate students have always just been fantastic. Parks and Wildlife has funded much of that work, and uh, Dr. Carter and I have written several extension publications on Rio Grande while I think you can find that at the Appalachian Extension Bookstore. And of course, uh, our landowners are so proud of y'all for being good schools out there along this access to your property to learn what we can about Rio Grande while serving another wildlife species. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Kathy. There was a lot of great information in that. Uh, and I encourage people, if you want to go back and watch it, uh, I posted a link on the chat panel. It's at texaswildlife.org under our resources tab. You can find this and all of the other recorded webinars in that tab. I actually have not had any questions come up on the chat window, so if any of y'all do have a question for Dr. Kathy before we cut off here, uh, please post that up in the chat window and I'll pass that information on to him. If y'all are interested in tuning in next month for our webinar, we're going to have a talk on wild pig management. Dr. Billy Higginbotham is going to be presenting that one. It's going to be on November 14th. So once again, it'll be the third Thursday of next month, same time, same place. Uh, we had one question come in. It says, how close to water are nests generally found? Mm, good question. Um, uh, there's a, a great, yes, so some, Birds are tied to water, and so I think that I would have that band or somewhere in that uh, quarter mile on either side. Uh, I would be doing pretty good if I was a bird placing this in the area. So those are very corridors, so very, uh, uh, so very important to not only wild turkey but a number of other birds as well. So anywhere from a quarter mile in, I'd, I'd be sure looking at that is pretty good. Okay, I appreciate that. And I'm not seeing any else, any other questions come in. We'll give it just one second. Uh, see if anybody else can come up with anything before we cut out. Again, if you have a question posted in the chat window, not in the question and answer panel. I'm not seeing anything else. So with that, we'll, we'll cut off. And thanks again, Dr. Kathy, for your time. And that was a great presentation. Thanks. We'll see all of y'all next time.